Okay, um, I'll just uh, acclimatize myself to the mic and to the technology, and it's working well. Okay, um, what I'm going to do today uh, in 20 minutes is uh, try to give a little bit of insight into questions about the way the media functions and the reasons why media might fail in relation to accurately reporting on conflicts and war. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the question of propaganda, what we understand by propaganda, and its role and importance in contemporary liberal democracies. I'm then going to go into talking about what we understand about what has been going on over the last 17 years with respect to the war on terror. Uh, and some of this material will be really drawing upon what we learned from the Chilcot Inquiry, which was published in 2016, which, as some of you are probably aware, was a six-year-long investigation into uh, the Iraq invasion, the lead-up to it, the use of intelligence, and also its aftermath. And I'm going to be drawing from the Chilgot report because it gives some very important and very powerful insights into the nature of the conflict which Western governments have been involved in over the last 16 and or 17 years. And that will take me through to then talking a little bit about Syria and what the indications are at this point in time about the relationship of the conflict in Syria to the war on terror and also raising questions which are going to be picked up, I think, in many of the other presentations about questions surrounding the legality of Western action in Syria, uh, questions surrounding the ethics of the way the media have covered the Syrian conflict. And hopefully that will set things up for the, for the following presentations to really start to dig into this question of um, the morality, legality of Western action, and also the morality and legality even of the way the media has covered both the war on Syria and also other conflicts over the last 16, 17 years. Where do I point it? Ah, I'm, I'm with you, right, okay. Ah, okay. Sorry, okay. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> okay. Okay, first of all, just to talk a little bit about why media fails. Um, there's always a good sort of first port of call for anybody who wants to understand the kind of structural constraints which act on mainstream media within a democracy. And this is, I'm sure this work is familiar to quite a lot of you, but this is the work of Herman and Chomsky. Um, it's known as their propaganda model. And what it does is really pull together from across the political communication literature the ver a variety of factors which essentially constrain journalists and means that they don't actually play the independent, autonomous and watchdog role that we expect them to in a democracy. And Herman and Chomsky talk about the importance of the, the size, concentration and ownership of the mainstream media, the way in which the ownership of most of the media outlets which people go to for their information um, is essentially associated with very large conglomerates which have overlapping interests and overlapping interests with government. And this produces a, a large structural constraint on the way the media operates. They also talk about reliance on advertising, that this creates a risk-averse tendency within a lot of mainstream media, not wanting to put out news reports which really start to challenge or cause problematic coverage which might upset people who are advertising through those media outlets. They also talk, and I'll jump past three and go straight to flat, they talk about the kind of criticism which is leveled at journalists when they do start to press powerful buttons when they st do start to speak truth to power. And, and we'll have a little bit of example of the kind of flack that we get from the mainstream media in a few minutes. They also talk, that there's an ideology, talk about there being an ideological problem, that journalists sit within a particular worldview, an ideologically informed worldview, which means that the way they see conflicts around the world is very often closely associated with the worldview of governments and powerful actors. So there's an ideological constraint working on journalists. But the most important one in, in many ways, and this is one which a lot of the literature tends to focus in on, is the way in which journalists routinely uh, defer to or rely upon official sources when they're constructing news. Okay? And this is probably the, the, the first most important thing which causes a very big problem for journalists to actually uh, try and cover the news in a way which is independent of powerful actors. It's their tendency to rely upon official sources or sources coming from powerful actors in society. And this gives us, um, at this point, to, to segue into the question of propaganda, because what happens when journalists 
are, are so reliant upon official sources is they, is they become acutely vulnerable to propaganda campaigns, attempts to manage the information environment. And this is where we get to this question of propaganda. Now, propaganda is something, I mean, when we say the word propaganda, we often, a lot of people will think of, well, Russian propaganda, or they might think of sort of independent media or alternative media spreading propaganda, etc. And obviously in liberal democracies, people don't often associate propaganda with mainstream media. Perhaps that's different amongst the audience here. But when we talk about propaganda, we're talking about coordinated attempts to influencing and shaping opinions and conduct. And the critical thing with propaganda is that it's not a consensual process. It's not an attempt to persuade people by rationally arguing with them or presenting them with the facts as they are. It's about manipulating information in order to get them to think something or to behave in a way that they wouldn't otherwise do unless they were being subjected to uh, that propaganda. So it's manipulation, essentially. It violates rational or free will. Often, propaganda involves deception, but not always. Propaganda can also involve persuasion through incentivization and also persuasion through coercion. Those are elements which are often missed out in the literature, but these are important parts of, co of, of propaganda. So although often it is deception, and in a lot of the talks that we'll be having today, people will talk about deception, etc., as, as a form of propaganda, it's, that's not the only way, way in which our beliefs and conducts are influenced by powerful actors in our society. Now, I've already said, I mean, maybe perhaps for the audience here, many of you sort of don't have any problem with talking about propaganda in the context of mainstream media. It's obviously something that the mainstream media would never say that they engage in, and it's obviously something which Western governments are extremely reluctant to ever admit that they're involved in propaganda activities. But of course, propaganda actually has a long history, and slightly cut off on the slide, but we have Edward Bernays there. He's considered the founding father of public relations in the 20th century. He was a relative of Sigmund Freud. And he talked in the 20th century about the need for the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses, an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our community. And these ideas and this debate over propaganda and manipulation was very extensive in the first part of the 20th century. It was openly talked about. However, at some point in the 20th century, and Eddie Bernays, uh, a direct quote from Eddie Bernays, says that, well, it, it came to get a, a bad name, this process of manipulation, this idea that in democracies you have to engage in managing the masses, etc. So he says, well, we had to rebrand it. So we came up with the term uh, Council of Public Relations, and therein was born PR, public relations. And ever since then, we have been, uh, people who employ propaganda have engaged in what Phil Taylor described as a euphemism industry. We have lots and lots of different terms which we use to refer to activities which we would have once described as propaganda. Whether it's psychological operations, strategic communication, public affairs, information operations, etc. These are all the terms you hear politicians and political actors using when they're talking about communicating with the public, etc. They don't use the term propaganda anymore. But as Phil Taylor pointed out repeatedly, this was essentially a way of disguising the fact that what's going on is some kind of manipulation. It's not a rational two-way process of trying to persuade people to agree with you. It's about manipulating them. And this is really one of the prime reasons why so many people have problems grasping the idea that we live in a society where democracy, where, sorry, propaganda is so prevalent and so important. It's been erased from our collective consciousness in a very significant way because of this euphemism industry. But we are in a world where there's propaganda and we're in a world where governments and liberal democracies do employ propaganda to a very significant extent. Just some of the techniques of propaganda, which is worth mentioning, um, and I'm slightly conscious whether I've got the... No, I haven't got the updated presentation, but that's okay, so I'll just stay with um, the one we've got here. Lying, when people think of propaganda, they often think of lying, that sort of, uh, I'm being lied to by the government. But in many ways, sort of straight lies are some of the most ineffective forms of propaganda. Lying is normally politically fatal if you're caught out making a statement which is untrue, etc. 
So a lot of propaganda activities involve slightly more subtle forms of manipulation of information. That could be distortion of information, exaggerating. It could be omission of information, excluding facts which are inconvenient to the narrative that you're trying to promote. Misdirection is another very common technique where you direct people to think about one issue rather than another issue, and you're doing that because it's politically inconvenient for you to have people thinking about a, a, a particular issue. So misdirection is, is a commonly used technique. Incentivization and coercion, incentivization, for example, offering tax cuts and elections and so on, is a form of trying to manipulate people. Some would say bribe people. Um, coercion is, an, is another form of propaganda. Sanctions, for example, is a coercive form of propaganda, trying to affect people's behavior and beliefs in target countries through employing sanctions. And the, the point of view of, of highlighting these aspects of propaganda is that you know, propaganda isn't just about influencing people's minds in some kind of abstract fashion. It's also a, a, a much more sort of uh, down-to-earth process in terms of pushing, coercing, and cajoling people. And it's worth keeping those ideas in mind because the more you think about the society we live in and the more you think through these ideas, the more you start to realize that we are in very significant ways coerced and incentivized to behave in particular ways. Okay, now to move to a discussion of the Iraq inquiry, and this is where I want to get into some empirical detail about the last 16, 17 years and the question of the war on terror and the conflicts that we've been involved in. Um, as I said, Bord, this is really information which is based pretty much on what came out of the Chilcot inquiry, but also which dovetails with a variety of other information which has come out over the last 10 years in order to help us to understand better what the West has been involved in um, for a very long time now. Now, the Chilcot Inquiry, when it came out, it, um, it certainly provided a sort of confirmation that what had happened in relation to the Iraq invasion, as I'm sure we're all very familiar, that what happened in relation to the Iraq invasion and the questions of weapons mass destruction was that there was a systematic exaggeration and manipulation of intelligence in order to create the sense of a much greater threat being posed by Iraq than was actually the case. Um, people will be vaguely familiar, I guess, with the September dossier. Uh, Tony Blair's remarkable claims made when that dossier came out, saying that it was beyond doubt, he believed, uh, beyond doubt that Saddam had continued to produce chemical and biological weapons, and the kind of headlines which people were subjected to. All of these claims, as we know now from the Chilcot inquiry, but also the Butler inquiry, really were a gross exaggeration of the available intelligence. The available intelligence, I think one uh, phrase was it was described as patchy and sporadic. And the most objective reading of the intelligence at, at the end of the day was that Iraq might have a WMD capability at some future point if sanctions were lift, lifted. That was the, really the kind of what the intelligence was saying. But it was manipulated and distorted into claims that Saddam could launch weapons of mass destruction within 45 minutes of an order and so on. It was a gross exaggeration. We've all become very aware of that over time. And I think this is something which has had a very powerful effect in alerting people to the problem of governments engaging in propaganda, of governments manipulating our perceptions of what's going on. But the most interesting thing about the Chilcot Report um, is something which actually wasn't very extensively covered by the mainstream media when it came out. Um, I know a lot of people sort of said when this came out, uh, or evidence of manipulation of intelligence on WMD, the response of many people was, well, we've known that for years. Chilcot is simply coming along and confirming something which has become well established. But what was really interesting about the Chilcot report, and this is, bears upon the conflict in Syria, and it bears upon our understanding of what's been going on for the last 17 years, um, as questions relating to the formative stages of the war on terror and to the documents that the Chilcot report released showing conversations between Tony Blair and George Bush in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, all the way back in 2001. And what this tells us, and I'll start to go through some of these documents, um, I'm wary of time. How many minutes have I got? I'm, I'm okay, I'm good, excellent. Um, this is one of the first documents, which is, or it, pieces of information released by Chilcot. And this is actually within about, I think if I remember correctly, five or six days of the 9-11 attacks, you had a communication from the British Embassy stating that the regime change hawks in Washington, 
were arguing that a coalition put together for the purposes of fighting a war on terror could be used for other things. It could be used to clear up other problems within the region. And so you, you have, I mean, it's not just the fact that this document exists and so on, it's the fact that Chilcott chose to draw our attention to it in the Chilcott report. He's trying to get people to understand what was happening, where the Iraq conflict came from. But what you have here is the first indication that the war on terror itself was being seen as a way of doing other things in the international system. Okay, um, In a sense, and as I'll say at the end, the war on terror itself being a form of propaganda in order to mobilize support for doing this other heavy lifting in the international system which is referred to. This is a very interesting document. This is, this is a communication from Tony Blair to George Bush. Um, this is probably about eight weeks after 9-11. And they'd had a discussion about whether to go for Saddam Hussein straight away. And this was something that the neocons in the Bush administration and Bush himself were advocating after 9-11. Can we use this to remove Saddam Hussein from power? And this is a, a plan offered up from Tony Blair that what they could perhaps do with Iraq uh, to avoid a full-scale invasion is that they could support opposition groups, um, set out an agenda for post-Saddam Iraq. Tony Blair then moves on to talking about sort of we can then mount covert op operations within Iraq. Okay, And then when there are rebellions occurring with Iraq, then we can move in and support those militarily and then hopefully topple the regime. And that's very interesting because this is, as I say, this has been communicated from Tony Blair. It's Tony Blair's writing going to George Bush. And it's giving you some ideas about other regime change operations that we might have been seeing, including Syria, as to what might have been going on in terms of the planning in, in relation to other conflicts. But what you have here, and, and just to put it very bluntly, you have no more, no less than British Prime Minister and American President plotting to overthrow uh, a government. Completely illegal under international law, obviously. Syria and Iran. This is a document setting out phases one and two of the war on terror. Because that's the other thing that Chilcott chose to draw our attention to, was that there was a phase one and two war on terror being discussed in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And here's Syria and Iran. We have uh, Tony Blair saying, if toppling Saddam is a prime objective, easier to do that with Syria and Iran in favor, or acquiescing rather than hitting all three at once. So clearly the discussion going on there is when to attack these three countries, with Tony Blair saying we need to back off Iran and Syria at the moment. Clear indication that there was a wide-ranging regime change operation being planned immediately after 9-11. Phases one and two, this is the list of countries which are contained in a document from Tony Blair to George Bush talking about um, phase one and two war on terror operations and that's the list of countries which were identified. It wasn't entirely clear which of these countries were being marked for full scale military action. Clearly Syria, Iran and Iraq were being marked for full scale uh, military engagement. What activities in the other countries was unclear from the documents. But clearly you have a regime change policy being implemented and put in place place in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. haven't got time for this slide here, but people are free to email me and I can email them the presentation and so on. But again, this is really just talking through phases one and two of the war on terror. Tony Blair is very open. I was talking about, you know, we don't use, or governments don't use the term propaganda in public. Well, they do use the term propaganda in private. And here we have Tony Blair talking about the need for a tightly knit propaganda campaign in relation to uh, the war on terror. Here is another document, and this is one of Tony Blair's aides talking about propaganda operations, getting a communication strategy underway, rapid rebuttal, grid pushed out, and so on. And then finally, another document, uh, not under the heading of propaganda, but fits within that definition, international initiatives in order to show how from 9-11, good can come from the world led by the USA. So talking about a humanitarian conference, talking about sorting out the Middle East peace process, and so on. All attempts to try and mobilize and shore up support for a wide-ranging war on terror, which they knew at this point was going to involve uh, multiple military actions against countries in the international system. Don't have time to play this. Some of you might have seen it already, but it's easy to see on YouTube. But, but really, the Chilcott report confirms what uh, General Wesley Clark claimed in 2006, that he was informed in the Pentagon six days after 9-11 that they were planning on taking out seven countries in five years. Um, so essentially, very strong confirmation that 
the war on terror, right from the beginning, was not simply about chasing after Al-Qaeda or whoever it was being claimed was responsible for 9-11. It was really about mobilizing support for a broader range of military operations. And that runs through, really, I think, so this is, raises questions about Syria, obviously. Designed to mobilize populations in support of aggressive military action. And also, ultimately, the Chilcot Report provides context now for the continued assessment of 9-11, the event itself, the sponsors who was involved in 9-11. And you can see that some of that coming out in terms of discussions from Senator Bob Graham and CIA's Bob Baer, who I think tend to point the finger at Saudi Arabia in terms of responsibility. And also ongoing research by, for example, Professor Halsey in Alaska, looking at the building collapses in New York and exactly what was going on there. And so really, so what I'm getting at here is what we understand now about the kind of regime change operations which were being put in place uh, back there uh, immediately after 9-11 really feeds into a sort of renewed discussion and analysis going on at the moment as to exactly what was going on with 9-11 and who were the sponsors and who was involved in it. So all very interesting. Understanding Syria to get to um, the final part of the presentation. What we certainly know about Syria is that we've had a multi-layered propaganda campaign involving think tanks, civil society organizations, as well as formal propaganda activities. And at the moment, it looks like it's an extremely extensive propaganda operation which has underpinned Syria. If the propaganda operation of the war on terror has been massive, Syria has certainly been huge and has clearly been connected to what we see in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. The narrative, as we know, which has been emphasized, has been that we have a brutal repressive Assad using chemical weapons versus a democratic revolution. And what's been obscured, and what we know now at least, has been obscured by that narrative, has been the extensive Western and Gulf state covert operations, for example, Operation Timber Sycamore, which has included supporting extremist militant groups within Syria. This conflict has not been a conflict which the West has been standing aside from. It's a conflict which the West has been very much involved in, and again, taking the link back to what we see after 9-11, clearly we see an evolution of policy, more or less moving in the same direction, ultimately leading to what we see in Syria and attempts to try to overthrow the Syrian government. This is, to quote somebody else, you're not just hearing from me, this is Professor Sachs, uh, an American professor, talking about four weeks ago. And he was very clear in an MSNBC interview, just before the airstrikes following the Duma event in, uh, in Ghouta. And he was very clear. He said that the half a million dead in Syria are a consequence of us, I think he, he says very directly. He mentions Operation Timber Sycamore. He explains that this supporting of extremist groups within Syria in order to try to overthrow the regime, um, he, he says very clearly is covert, it's illegal, it was not authorized by Congress, and it's been the primary problem fueling the conflict and meaning that so many people have actually died in, in the conflict. And so you're getting sort of very high-profile support for a reinterpretation of what we see in Syria, and in the following presentations, we'll see this very clearly in terms of more detail. To sum up, um, propaganda, going back to the start of the presentation, is indeed it's ubiquitous to modern democracies. We do live in a world where this is extensively employed, even though governments don't admit to it, and even though mainstream media are very reluctant to admit to being a sort of part of a propaganda machine. The war on terror itself needs to be start to be understood itself as a propaganda construct designed to mobilize Western populations and underpinning, or that has ultimately underpinned a series of highly destructive conflicts throughout the Middle East and in the international system. Info ops in terms of the perceptions of Syria and this failure to understand our covert involvement in Syria indicates quite how successful the propaganda operations have been for a long time in relation to Syria. And all of this really just leads us to, and I'll finish on this because we'll pass on to the presentation which we'll start getting into some of these details. We now have very serious questions confronting us as publics, our politicians, our media, with respect to the morality and legality of not just actions in Syria, but actions over the last 17 years, the regime change operations we've been employing, the extremely dubious legality, if not obvious illegality, of what's been going on. Um, and what that means essentially for the state of our democracy and what it means for the state of our media and our ability to actually understand what's going on in the, going on in the world. But these are the questions which now very much confront us as a society and which we need to start engaging with and dealing with in a very open way. Thank you.